Welcome to Holding Forth the Word of Life Ministries, located on Broad Street in the heart of Renz, Georgia. Our founder, Linda Laracy, holds a master's degree in education and an honorary doctorate in church ministry. She is actively involved in church discipleship and has been for over 30 years. Her passion is to see people grow spiritually as they discover their life's purpose and identity in Jesus Christ. Please feel free to join our services on Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. or visit us online at hfwministry.com. Let's prepare our hearts to receive an anointed message from the Word of God. So tonight, I, I, I still want to move in uh, taking responsibility. Say this with me. Leaders take responsibility. Leaders take responsibility. And say, when I take responsibility. When I take responsibility. I gain power. So when I take responsibility, I move in authority. When I take responsibility, I move in authority. All right. And you want to get to a place where people understand that you're moving in authority. All right. Um, so how do you get there? First of all, you make a decision that you want to lay down your life for the Lord. In other words, you want to lose your false self to what? Find your true self. All right. You will never find your voice until you find your true self. Everybody can listen to a lot of voices, but tell me about the voices that you hear. A lot of times they're what? And do you know you have a vo voice that's false? You have, a, you have a false voice because it comes from a what? False self. So the Lord is saying this is a month for you to learn how to speak out from your true self. But to do that, you got to want it. And you got to start going to God's throne room of mercy and saying, Lord, I want to know my true self. I want to lose my false self, but I need help to do that. Have mercy on me, Lord. Because this is not going to happen overnight. And you know, how many failures may you experience? All right, so that's why you, as long as you want it, all right, look, as long as you want it, you're not faking anybody out. And you're not faking yourself out. You're not in pretense. You know, a person who's in pretense when they fail, they pretend that they've succeeded. Yeah. So you're a liar. And so you're not going to get anywhere. But if you say, you know, I'm failing. I, I, I want to succeed. I want to be God's man. I want to be God's woman. But I'm failing. That in itself is what? Truth. So you speak it. You bring it up to God. And you say, Lord, have mercy on me. And help me because I want to change this. Can you change? Yes. And you got to think that you can change because it's going to be Jesus that's going to help you change. So let's go to Titus chapter 2 verse 7. Titus is a powerful little book of the Bible. And I would encourage you, I think it's only three chapters. Why don't you read it? Because when you read Titus, you're reading how things are done in an apostolic church. Right. Titus moved apostolically and we need to move apostolically that word apostolic is not a weird word y'all the whole new testament the whole new testament is about well first of all jesus christ is the chief apostle, chief apostle. and then the letters that have been written are written by who apostles. apostles so we need to learn we can find our voice our true voice as we move under apostolic teaching. And I'm going to teach you tonight apostolically. So let's begin. Titus 2.7 says, Always set a good example for others. What should you do? Always set a good example for others. Say it again. Always set a good example for others. Who wants to say ouch? Ouch. Because what are we supposed to do? Always set a good example for others. Now, you know what? Some people will read that and say, forget it, I can't do it. I say, read it and say, you know what? I'm going to do it, and if I fail, I'm going to go back into the throne room of mercy. And say, you know, Lord, I failed here. I did not set a good example here. But I want to change that. So don't beat yourself up, because I tell you what, the devil does enough of that. Why are you helping the devil? Because I'm telling you, he's here to beat you up. And he's here to get you in condemnation. So first of all, just begin to think, all right? I I'm going to be a leader. 
And I'm going to first start being a leader simply by what? What's that? So are you very conscious that when you step into any environment, you are to do what? What are you to be? So that would mean in your family, at your work, wherever you are, in the house of God, when you go to the grocery store, what are you to do? All right. That is being a leader. And uh, wherever you go, you are to what? Set an example for others. That immediately positions you to be a leader and for you to gain power and authority because you are taking responsibility to be what? A good example for others. Be sincere. In other words, don't live in pretense. You know, own your stuff. If you fail, if you mess up, don't pretend. Own it. Be sincere and serious when you teach. We have to be sober-minded. These, you know, life is not always a party, right? And if you are a type of person that cannot get serious, you got to look at that. It's because you got so much pain, you overlay that pain by being laughing all the time are staying in, in light things, are empty things. So the scripture is saying, be sincere and serious when you teach. Somebody said, well, I'm not a teacher. Yes, you are. Do you have children? Yeah. If you are a mother, what are you? A teacher. You're an absolute teacher. If you are in a workplace, do you have to train people? Okay, you are a what? Teacher. We're always teaching by how we're leading our life. Then it says, use clean language. Let's say that. Use clean Say it again. Use clean and one more time. Use clean All right, to be a leader, you're going to have to take responsibility that in all situations, what are you going to be? Use you're going to be an example for others. You're going you're to teach and be serious and sincere, and you're going to do what with your language? Use All right, so what is clean language? What can we absolutely say is not clean language? Absolutely, you don't want to curse. Now, this is why. If you are known for your hot temper and that when you get mad, cuss words fly out of your mouth, tell me what that does to your authority when you want to bring a correction to somebody in the Lord. If you fuss and fight, raise your voice, get upset, you are absolutely demeaning your authority and you're not setting a good example. So we really have to get a hold of this. Now, I'm going to just tell you right now, if you don't have clean language, that can change tonight. True or not? True. Now, you can say, well, what if it slips? Well, what if it slips? Immediately. You know, that's wrong. And I'm asking God to help me with that. And I ask you to forgive me. And then you go back into the throne room of God and say, Lord God, give me, a, give me clean lips. Now, if you think you can do this by just your willpower alone, what does that say about you? You have to place your faith in who? Jesus Christ. All right, so do this and your enemies will be too ashamed to say anything against you. So if you will set a good example, you will be sincere, you'll be serious, you'll use clean language uh, so that nobody will criticize you. People are really looking to criticize you. Why, does, why do people want to criticize leaders? Because if they can criticize a leader, they don't have to follow that leader. And they don't have to follow what that leader says. So you know this saying, uh, do what I say, not as I do? You, you remember that saying? You know, do what I tell you to do, but don't do how I do. That's terrible. That never works. We have to say, but we also have to do what we say to be a leader, to take responsibility. All right, and you, you want your enemies not to criticize you. Basically, you just want your enemies not to say anything about you. That's about the best they can do. 
They're not going to love you. They're not going to bless you. But if you can just get them to the place where they can't say anything bad about you, you've got to a good place. Because this is why you're living such a godly life and a good life that if they know they criticize you, the person that's hearing it is like, that's not true. So they just can't say anything. Now that's a great place to what? To be. All right, Titus 2, 14 through 15. And the reason why they can't say anything is your, the fruit of your life is getting very evident. All right. He gave himself to rescue us from every evil. Now say this with me. God has rescued me from every evil. God has rescued me from every evil. So what is evil in you? God can rescue that. You get that? So... What iniquity have you got in your life? Well, you don't, you don't have to rescue yourself. God can rescue. Is that good news? Yeah. See, this is, this is something you can tell people. Is this something good you can tell somebody? Yeah. Is this something you can speak to somebody that's truth? Do you know anybody right now that's in pain that you can look at and say, let me tell you something. Jesus gave himself to rescue you from this. And he has the power to do that. You don't have to live your life like this anymore. There's a better way. Is that something you can say to somebody in your life? Is it godly? Is it the truth? All right. He gave himself to rescue us from everything evil and to make our hearts pure. Is that not a wonderful thing? How many of you want your hearts pure? Yes. But how many of you know that you're unable to make your heart pure? Yes. But who can make your heart pure? Yes. All right. Our part is to go to God and say, Lord, purify my heart. I can't do it on my own, Lord. But you can. Now, this is what's going to happen. You're going to start praying, Lord, purify my heart, and all this junk's going to come up. And you're, you're going to do one or two things. You're going to condemn yourself and say, look at me. I'm not, I'm not a leader. I can't do anything right. I might as well just give it all up. Or you can say, the reason why this is coming up is for me to see it so I can take this to where? I can take it to the throne room of grace where I can find mercy and help in my time of need. Say this with me. Satan's best strategy against me, strategy against is, me. Condemnation. is condemnation. If I get in condemnation, if I get in condemnation I'm going to lose. Are you going to lose? No. Amen. Are you going to be smarter than the devil? All right, he wanted us to be his own people and to be eager to do right. And, and God will put that in your heart. You'll get to the place where you'll want to do right. Because this is why. When you do right, you're going to get blessed. Everybody I've ever known that's gone through deliverance and have gotten a great deliverance, right after that they were abundantly blessed, had great light on them. And those same people a lot of times will fail and then they'll start moving in disobedience. If you can get people to remember how good it was when they came into deliverance. How light it was. Who gets what I'm saying? How joyful it was. But a lot of times people can't maintain it. They fall. You know, you know like when you're drunk, you, the, the saying is you fall off the wagon. You know, you, you get dry for a while. I don't know why they say that. I'm sure there's a reason for that. People say they fall off the wagon. Well, a lot of times people go through deliverance and they what? They fall off the wagon. And they get so much in condemnation, they think, well, you know what? God's not going to do it again. You know what? Will God do it again? But you've got to want it. And you've got to believe that he's come to rescue you and that he can put a desire in you to what? To do right. Teach these things. Now, what are you supposed to teach? Perfect. What are you supposed to teach? The things I just said. The things, actually, that came from Titus. We need to tell people your heart can be pure. God can put a motivation in your heart to do right. And God can absolutely rescue from every evil thing. Your life can totally change. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. And the reason why you can say amen is because you know it's what? It's true. it's true. And you know it's true why? Because you've been there. All right. These are things that a leader needs to be able to say 
to people. All right? Expressing yourself from a true place. All right, 1 Timothy 1, 4 and 5. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion. Now, when you express yourself in your true self, are you going to nag? No. Are, are you going to beat a dead horse? No. Do you understand that saying, beat a dead horse? How many more ways can you say it? <laughs> can I get a witness? Amen. You've said it, and then you do what? Amen. You say it again, and then you do what? Amen. All right, that is not from your true self. Because actually, if you have to say something, the same thing, over and over and over in the same conversation. Yeah. Are you getting anywhere? Yeah. Actually, the more you say it, the less authority you have. That's why parents have to tell their kids ten times to do something. Somebody tell me amen. amen. The reason why you have to tell that kid ten times to do something is they don't believe you the first time. Because you let them get away with everything the first time. If they don't do it the first time, what do you do? You discipline them. But see, you don't do that. You think, I, if I say it ten times, they'll finally get it. They've already tuned you out. And why have they tuned you out? Because you have no authority in their eyes. See, if you're a parent that moves in authority, you say it one time. And then you move in discipline. And if you keep doing that consistently, tell me what's going to happen to that child. Wouldn't it be wonderful, moms and dads, if you could take your child the first time? Would you have a house of peace? Well, now I'm going to tell you something. You can blame your kid for the house of turmoil you have. Or you can what? You can take ownership. Can you change up? Now listen. I've got to break the news to you. If you wait till they get teenagers, I'm so sorry. Listen, you're not raising a two-year-old, you're raising an adult. Did you hear what I said? The problem is you think you're raising a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. No. You're raising what? An adult. What you do then is how they're going to be when they're an adult. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, that means when he gets an adult, he will not stray from it. But you've got to learn how to train. People who train have authority. You go into the military, are you trained? Tell me what happens if you don't train. You're going to be booted out. Because people in authority are telling you what to do. Come on, give, let me get a witness. All right, you, you, gotta, you got to get that. And, and see, I know I get on, I get a lot on, I, I never come here to talk about what you think I talk about. If you think I come here to talk about certain things, and I've got it all figured out beforehand, it's not. Do you know when I finish a message, I realize what the needs are in the house? Because the message has actually come out, and it fits the need. Now, did you understand what I said? I, I, I never, ever memorize what I'm going to say. I don't think about what I'm saying. I get my scriptures by the Spirit. But have you ever noticed that when the scripture goes, it can go in many different directions? And I can tell you, there's a lot. And just recently, I've been on kids a lot. And there's a reason for that. Because we have a need in the body for our children. So the scripture is saying, don't let them waste their time in endless discussion. If you're a leader, you don't have to keep on and on and on about things. Say it one time. Do you get what I'm saying? Because if you keep on, they're tuning you out. And for Pete's sakes, do not start getting into crazy debates with people. 
Have you done that? Then you get in an argument. And you started out talking about spiritual things. And then you get into an argument with a person. Well, let me tell you, that person has baited you. The devil will bait you. There's no need in getting into any kind of theological debate with people. All right. Just remember that as a leader. Say what you need to say and then do what? Say, say this. My words will be few. My words will be few. Which don't help people live a life of faith in God. Don't get into these long, lengthy discussions going on and they're arguing and you're arguing. You've lost everything. That doesn't help people live a life of faith in God. If you know that the conversation is going to an argument, what do you need to do? Just get quiet. All right? The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. That's what you want to do. When you're talking with people, it's all about you want people to know the love of God. You want people to, to have a pure heart, to have a clean conscience. Is there a way for a person to have a clean conscience? Absolutely. And you can help a person know that. You can also help a person know that even in their deepest, darkest sin, God still loves them and has a great plan for their life. People need to hear that. And you, as a leader, can actually speak that to people. You want to help them come to genuine faith in Jesus Christ. All right, James 1, 19 through 20. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be what? Quick, quick to listen. A leader, say this with me, a leader, a leader. Is, quick is quick to listen. To listen. All right, what that means is you're very much alive to listen. Now, I, this is, you're not a leader. I want to make myself clear. You're not a leader if somebody's talking and you're not listening. You're just trying to come up with something for you to say. Who's ever done that? You're trying to be smart, right? And you're trying to give some kind of retort to a person. So you're not really listening to what that person has to say to you. Your brain is in overdrive. Trying to come up with something to say back. You get that? No, no, no. That's not love. Listen. Just quiet your soul. Listen. Hey, listen, you might learn something. You might learn that what you're developing in your brain to say is actually the wrong thing to say. Because I tell you something, a lot of times... What you think you've heard from a person is not what is really what the person is saying. You, people will get, they'll get misjudgments on what people say to them through their filters of wounds. And it's because you don't thoroughly listen. If you listen long enough, you'd be surprised how many times they're not even talking about the same thing you think they're talking about. Leaders listen. They're sharp to listen. And then the scripture says, be slow to what? Speak. So, to be slow to speak would mean that you're not going to speak a whole lot. You're going to choose your words carefully and you're just going to be slow to speak. And I told you the other day, I think I, it was in the message last Wednesday, about George VI, who had the speech impediment. Remember that? It was called the King's Speech. And um, he had to be trained how to give speeches. And when he gave a speech, he would slow down his speech because he had a stuttering problem. And the people didn't even know he had a stuttering problem. They thought it was just elegant the way he spoke. <laughs> They thought he was so powerful when he spoke because he spoke how? Slowly. 
All right. You'll be quick to listen, slow to speak, and then what? Anger is a problem. Human anger is a problem. So what happens to your leadership when you get angry? So you've set an example, you've set an example, you've said all these spiritual things to people, but you continue to get what? Angry. Now tell me what's really going on. Are you really setting an example? No. Now you're talking spiritual today, right? But the next day, you're angry. At the same people, you are what? Now, and because this is a habit with you, tell me what they've done. Have they tuned you out? So really and truly, do you have any authority? No, you don't. Now, you know what? You can deceive yourself and think, well, just because they're listening to you. But sometimes people have to listen to you, especially if you're a boss. Oh, y'all just love me? Gosh. <coughs> you can be a boss and be an authority but not have true authority. True or not? Or you can be a boss and have authority and then have what? True what? Spiritual authority because you're setting the right example and you are leading by the Holy Spirit. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to what? Get angry. Do you know the number one reason why people get angry is they get frustrated. Yeah. And this is why they get frustrated, because they have blocked goals. You get blocked, you get frustrated, and then you get what? Then you get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. That's a powerful scripture. I, but it may be hard for you to understand. You want God's righteousness operating in your life because it's going to lead you to blessing. You want to stay on the righteous path because it will always lead you to blessing. But if human anger is a part of your life, it does not produce the righteousness of God. So you won't be able to get the blessing because anger has a way of absolutely drowning out the righteousness of God. So if you want to stay on the righteous path, you've got to deal with that anger problem. Now, immediately I can feel in the spirit because humans get angry. You either get angry outwardly or you get angry how? Inwardly, but you get angry. And this is an issue that a lot of people will get condemned on. I say don't get condemned. I say just get a hold of your anger problem, confess it, own it, and start going to God with it. Just go to God with it. Ask him to help you. Now, think about the areas where you get angry. Are there areas in your life that you're more prone to be angry than other areas? Yeah. True? True? So you should prepare. Now, are there certain people in your life that seem to engender anger more than others? Well, when you know you're going to be around those people, what if you make that a matter of prayer beforehand? This is how we train and practice. This is how we grow. This is how we become true spiritual people. It's not magic, y'all. It is a true process of sanctification through faith in Jesus Christ. And over time, you will change. And you will actually become a different person. And you'll find out, you know, I used to be an angry person, but you know, I have to say, I'm not angry like I used to be. Would that be a glorious day? All right, 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you were young. 
but set an example for the believers how? In speech. The very first thing Apostle says, we're to set an example how? In our speech. And what we say. And then in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. But the first thing he says is what? Speech. 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 Now, when you read that scripture, how can you control whether people are going to look down on you or not if you're young? Because it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. There's a hidden meaning in that. Listen, earn people's respect by the example you set. And then they won't look down on you. See, people will look down on you if you are speaking spiritual things but you're not living a spiritual life in front of them. Got it? And they basically will tune you out. See, it is true that any leader, often leaders um, are, are slandered, right? People can slander you. People can actually say things against you. And we're never to take slander into our heart because people lie about people. But your actions don't lie. And so when you're around people, come on, and people actually see you moving in a certain way, that's not slander because they've actually seen it Lifing out, how? In your life. So see, they will look down on you. But don't allow people to look down on you because you're going to be in partnership with the Lord, covenant with God, that you're going to really lay down your life and you are going to what? Set an example for other people. Can you do that? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Now, I know that all of us, we have stress in our life. We have, we have weaknesses in our life. But I'll tell you one thing. When you go to work and you're a Christian and people know you're a Christian, you must what? You must absolutely at all times do what? And, and when you want to get mad, and you want to cuss somebody out, or you want to be mean to your coworker? you need to do what? What do you need to do? You need to bring it down. Now, you might go home that night and let it out on your spouse, not, in other words, let off some steam. In other words, say, oh, I had the worst day today. That's okay, because you're letting that steam off. You're just saying, oh, you know, it was so terrible, and I weren't really wanted to get mad, but I was able, by the grace of God, to rein it in. Everybody needs a sounding board. Who gets it? But a true leader, and we need leaders in this community, you've got to take ownership and take responsibility. When you are working, when you're in this house, it's not what you're doing when you're giving a testimony. It's how you're acting on the... And everybody's acting really good right now, so I'm not criticizing anybody. <laughs> I have to watch my language because everybody's so sensitive. You're on the back row and you're talking with people. Is that setting a good example? No. Nobody's doing that in the house, by the way. Everybody's listening. But see, even in this house, you can set a bad example for people right around you. See, really, to be a leader, we need to be conscious of how we're what? Acting because we don't want to bring an offense to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we do something that is out of place, the best thing you can do is what? You can go and apologize. But let me tell you, even apologies get old after a while. I mean, if you've got to tell somebody you're sorry ten times a week about the same thing, you're going to get tuned out. 
Because really, you don't need to say you're sorry. What do you really need to do? Change. Change. That's going to be the witness that the people are going to see that's going to say something's happened. And then they can say, you know what? God is real. People want to know God's real. People want to know that God truly will come into where you are and help you change and give you a good life. All right, 2 Timothy 2.16. Look at this one. We're talking about speech now, and we lead with our speech. But avoid worldly and empty chatter. Can I say it again? What are we to avoid? All right, so it says we have to avoid it. So what does that mean is going to happen to you? Are you going to get an opportunity to chat up with somebody? So what are you supposed to do? All right, so what kind of chatter are we talking about? It says empty and worldly. Can you imagine what that could be? Nothingness? Could it be gossip? Could it just be running your mouth? Can I just say that? What's the problem with running your mouth? Does that in any way gain you authority or power? Because a lot of times people say, oh, gosh, I don't want to get in a conversation with so-and-so because I know once I get in it, what? Because this person, what? Goes on and what? On and on. You know anybody like that? You might say, it. yeah, Apostle, it's me. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I'm not looking at anybody. All right. But you know what? Sometimes people do that because they have anxiety in their life. And sometimes people do that because it helps them to feel comfortable around people. And they think it puts people at ease. So we got to set the right example. Now, listen, did I write the Bible? Because I can tell you right now, I can feel you don't like what I'm saying. It's okay. You don't have to like what I'm saying. But I'm going to say it anyway. Because I'm here to elevate you. I'm trying to help you. And while I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. Because it's the Word of God. We must what? Avoid worldly and what? Empty chatter. We need to be informed. We need to know what's going on. We need to have cogent information given to us. Yes, I get all that. That's fine. But just to be talking, just to what? Talk. According to the scripture, it leads to further ungodliness. Do you see how empty chatter leads to further ungodliness? Because, you know, it can take a negative, it can take a nosedive. It can turn into slander. It can turn in for you saying certain things that you're going to regret later, right? Look, I was just talking to somebody today, and they were talking about how, you know, you start off with cigarettes, and then you go from cigarettes to marijuana, right? Marijuana to cocaine or whatever. You know how that goes. Well, that's what this is talking about. You start off with worldly and empty chatter. Does it just stop there? No. According to Scripture, it what? It leads into further ungodliness. You're leading, but are you leading in the right way? Well, look, again, I want to say this to you. Leadership is about speaking. Our words are very, very important, and we do influence and we lead people by what comes out of our mouth. This is the month of speaking, expressing our true self.
In other words, it's the month to express love. Start this month to speak truth, to speak it in love, to have your words few. You want them few because if you talk too much, people are going to turn you off. I'll tell you, somebody who is not shy and is not timid, but is a, a person of few words, when they do speak, what happens? That's a leader. And that's backed up by Scripture. We really need to watch what comes out of our mouth. All right, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4 says this. What are we to do? What are we to do, everybody? Okay, well, I, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not a preacher. Really? Well, let me ask your children that. <laughs> let me ask your spouse that. People preach. They pick a subject and they what? All right. So really, we are to, any opportunity we are given, we are to what? Speak the word of God. Now come back. Come back to me. Does that mean when you're in a conversation with somebody, I'm about to speak the word of God to you? You don't have to say that. Now, sometimes you do get a word from the Holy Ghost and you need to say, the Spirit of God wants you to know this and you release it to Him. But I'm just talking about truth. Truth is truth is truth. Does it make truth any stronger to tell somebody, well, the Bible says? You don't have to say what the Bible says. You just need to speak what the Bible says. Okay? And that is the word of God. Just always whatever comes out from your mouth, test it before it comes out and discern is what I'm about to say, does that line up with scripture? And if it lines up with scripture, then it is the word of God. Preach the word of God, be prepared. That's a powerful word. What is that phrase again? Be prepared. Is preparation important? You got preparation is very powerful. You you need to actually prepare yourself to be a person who's going to speak when they get the opportunity. Be ready. Be thinking. Be asking God. If you know you're going to talk to somebody, what should you be asking God? What do I need to say? Be prepared. Now, another thing about leadership and speaking is that we need to be patient. We should patiently correct. Is that good? Yes. Patiently correct. What is that R word? Review. No, it cannot say that. Honestly. See, only apostolic ministries rebuke. Because you know God is God of love and there's no way he's going to rebuke you. No, we all need to be rebuked, okay? The word of God rebukes us. Patiently correct, you've got to be patient. You don't want to lose your temper. You don't want to get frustrated. You want to patiently correct and you need to rebuke at times. And, and you need to what? Encourage. Your people with good teaching. Hey, look, if you are patiently correcting and you are an encouraging as well, then when you do have to give the occasional rebuke, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Because the person knows that you also encourage and you also very patiently correct others. For a time is coming, listen to this. Are we in this time now, you guys? Yes. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They don't want to listen. What will they do instead? They will follow their own desires. And they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Do you understand? They will reject the truth and chase after myths. 
So right now we have churches today that people sit under teachings and it doesn't bring any rebuke. It doesn't bring any correction. It's basically I'm okay and you're okay. And, and there's really no strong rebuke. Do you, let me ask you, tell me what happens every time we get on our mes message here. It's a general rebuke, maybe. It's a corporate rebuke. You know what? It's good for you. It's really good for you. Because it helps you. We don't want to be a people that sugarcoat the truth. We, we don't want to be the person that when a person is in sin and they've actually shared that they're in sin or you know they're moving in sin, that you say, well, honey, it's okay. Jesus will forgive you. You know what? That's a part truth. Will Jesus forgive you? But is it okay? The truth is, this is wrong what you're doing. This is not going to bring you into protection. This is not going to bless you. The Lord loves you, and he's got a better way for you to live. People don't want to hear the truth today. That's why you can live a homosexual lifestyle today and actually find churches that move in homosexuality. Now, there was a day when you couldn't even think that would happen. But that day's here now. So how will they ever hear the truth? They'll never hear the truth because they've chosen to find a place, correct, that they can hear a message that does not bring any conviction. See, sometimes people get highly offended with the messages I bring. Can I just tell you, you're not offended, you're under conviction. It's the Spirit of God who's bringing a conviction to you. And instead of you seeing that and taking that to the Lord and saying, Lord, I want to change that, you choose to get offended. Well, listen, I'm going to tell you to keep coming back. <laughs> because you'll get, this, you'll get more of the same. And I'll tell you what, you stick with it. It may be a day that you'll leave the offense behind and you'll actually get convicted and say, enough is enough. Amen. Everything I'm speaking to you, every rebuke I bring you, I bring it to you out of love. Right. Because I know by the Spirit, if you continue in sin, you will reap the consequences of your sin. We're here to bring people higher. Yeah. We're not here to have people stay on the same low rung. Understand what I'm saying by a rung? That's like a ladder. Let's go from this. Honey child, we'll take the lowest of the low. Yes. Hey, we've all, we all can say we're the lowest of the low. We all started on the lowest of the low, right? That's right? But through the grace of God and through our faith placed in Jesus Christ and our desire to get help, we've gone what? From glory to glory, to glory. And that's the message of the gospel. But you've got to be able to speak that. So you know what? When the apostle brings a message and you get offended and then you go to somebody else in the house to complain and talk about it, what are you going to do? You going to get in line with the one who's offended? Maybe you should say this, honey child, if the shoe fits... Because you've got to be the one who leads as well. This is a house of what? Leadership. Leadership. All right, 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10. We're going to close with this. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. Isn't that powerful? Hey, when you're moving by the Holy Ghost, do you need the law? You don't need the law. 
Because you're moving by what? Because the law is written in your heart. You're going to do the law anyway because it's written in your heart. But, but I'll tell you who needs the law. Lawless people. Now, have you ever heard this saying, I've got to lay down the law. That's not a bad thing. When you're dealing with somebody who's lawless, the only thing that will help that person is to do what? Lay down the law. Because they're not going to move by the Holy Ghost. They're going to move by their carnal desires. So you're going to do one or two things. You're going to sugarcoat their carnal desires and be afraid. Are you going to do what? You're going to lay down the law. And you know what? Something beautiful is going to happen. Because you're going to get results. One way or the other, I'll tell you what. If the person that you're laying down the law with isn't affected, you'll be affected. They may not go higher, but who will go higher? You'll go higher. This is how we lead. What's another name for law? Boundaries. For the law was not intended for people who do what is... You don't need boundaries with a person who's going to do what's right. They're going to do it anyway because they're moving by the love of God. But how many people do you know that don't move by the love of God? And who are living in carnality and living by the flesh. A lot, right? So you got a choice to make. You either lay down boundaries or you say, anything goes. If you're a leader, what will you always do? Because you're controlling? No, because you care for the other person. And you want that person to rise. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are, tell me. And what? Oh, come on, y'all. All All right. The law, boundaries, are for people who are, number one, what? Lawless. Lawless. Number two, rebellious. rebellious. Number three, ungodly. And number four, So if you know anybody like that, what should you do? The law is for people who are, then it goes, now, you know, the Holy Ghost now wants to really zone in on the rebellious. Let's describe them. The law is for people who are what? Sexually immoral. So do you need to lay down the law for sexually immoral people? Hello? I can tell you one thing. I I have a a single daughter, and if she brought a boyfriend home and said, Mom, we want to sleep together tonight in my bedroom, I'd say, really? (laughs) Not in my house. But she's got enough of sense not to say that. <laughs> but that would go for any sinful or immoral behavior. I'm not, because why? Why? It's my house. It's my house. And I'm a leader in my house. Come on. And if somebody's in my house that's going to be lawless, who's it up to to lay down the law? Is it for the person who's lawless? Do you think they're going to lay down? Who's going to lay down the law? If you're a leader, you will. Is that controlling? No, you're actually doing what the Word of God says. But see, we live in such a twisted culture that you'll actually feel bad because you lay down the law. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or slave traders. Well, you know, we have sex slaves now. And that word could be also kidnappers. Promise breakers, you know, people who you cannot trust. Whatever they say, you can't trust what they say. Or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news. 
Now, are we going to be leaders? Yes. Are you going to be a leader? Yes. Now, have you heard this message? Yes. Okay, now look, is this the first of the months? Yes. If we will do this, and if we fail doing it, do we allow condemnation to come? No, no where do we go? We go to the throne room of God where there's mercy and where we can find help in our time of need. We're going to do that. And every month throughout this next year, from Nisan to Nisan, from Passover to Passover, we should be going in what direction? Higher and higher and higher. And not only will we be elevated, but every person that God has foreordained for us to be connected to, if we do our part in the Lord, they will also benefit from it. Because we are a people who love and who know that faith in Jesus Christ can set people free. Because it first what? Set us free. Amen and amen. I was a young African American from Gibson, Georgia, and uh, never been out of the state of Georgia. And uh, I just was so excited and anxious to get out into the world. Once I got out into the world, uh, I received uh, a lot of bad habits. And I was moved in sexual immorality, going to bars, smoking cigarettes, gambling. I was addicted to all of that. Those were spirits of addiction. I was getting DUIs every other year, paying out money, didn't have a license. One particular event, I drove all the way to Texas with no license. Oh, how great was that? How crazy was that? Satan had me under his spell. And as far as the uh, alcoholism, um, I would drink, I would go to work, uh, alcohol on my breath. Uh, before I go to work, I would pop me a can. <clears throat> uh, lunch break, I would, oh, I had me a can of beer in the car, maybe two beers, sometimes even a six pack. You know, I thought that was the way of life. And um, I had to have, I thought I had to have that alcohol and my cigarette to, to, to function. But that was a lie from the devil. Anxiety and fear. I thought the cigarette and the beer would calm me down. That was a lie from the devil. 2011, I went alcohol free. I went cold turkey. It was God that did it. I was 44 years old that, that when I found the real Jesus, not the genie Jesus, the fake Jesus. I thought I knew him. I thought I could say my prayers and I don't have to go to church. That was a lie. I need to be around people. This is where my help at. My faith really was tested when my wife um, had, a, had a surgery back in July and August. Um, uh, and um, I got real full of anxiety, nervousness, and fear. And I, I just really broke down. I lost it. But uh, my sister in Christ laid hands on me and, and, and began to speak over me. And immediately, that nervousness and fear and anxiety, it was gone. I was able to stand on the word of God and have faith that my wife would be healed through God. The body of Christ said that she would be healed, that she would be well. That word was sent forth in the atmosphere. And God said in his word, who's never sent his word, it shall not come back void, but prosperous. She was healed. She really was healed. And that really tested my faith in God. Uh, Christ told Peter uh, when he walked on the water, they got very afraid. And uh, Christ said, this is me, be not afraid. And uh, Peter reached for Christ with Peter's hand and got him on the water. Peter immediately drowned it. Christ immediately pulled him up. He's an old ye, a little faith. Peter took his eye off God. He, he lost his faith. And as for me, if I take my eyes off God, I'm gonna drown back to the world of sin. I will not. I will never turn back to the world. Said I'm turning away.